and I actually got a couple of emails about this just in the last day or two. Um, people like saying, Hey, I love your stuff, but man, you know, you talk about the photo and scope thing or this thing or that thing. And you, I think, I feel like it's destroying the industry. It's destroying the industry. If you're an experienced adjuster, if you're a veteran adjuster, if you've been doing this for three or four years and you got a lot of storms under your belt, you're doing daily stuff and somebody says, Hey, you want to do hourly? I'd say, no, don't do it. No way. I'm going to, I want the fee bill. Give me the fee bill or give me death. <laughs> right. Um, but for brand new people who, for whatever reason, are, are struggling to get the, the you know, the, the on-site resources to pay attention to them, this happens to every single cat. Um, and they, they wash out. Nobody's answering their phone calls. They can't get anybody to help them close their claims. And that person is on a fee schedule. They're not getting paid until they close a the claim. And if they can't close the claim, they're not going to get paid. They're not going to be able to pay, pay for their hotel. They're not going to be able to pay for fuel and all that kind of stuff. If they're getting paid hourly, at least there's... Um, there's a little bit of more support there. They, they can say, all right, well, you know, I'm not going to be up till two or three o'clock in the morning, you know, trying to close these claims. I can take a, d a deep breath and I can wait for the help room people to get, get around to me instead of having a panic attack and throwing everything in the air and running away. You're watching Adjuster TV, Adjusters First. Adjuster TV is brought to you by Kaplik. Learn all about E&O and other insurance for adjusters at cplic.net slash adjuster TV. And by the National Association of Catastrophe Adjusters. Joining NACA will provide you with the resources you need to build a lasting career as a claims professional at adjustertv.com slash NACA. And by Adjuster TV Plus. Get unlimited access to a growing library of the best adjuster training videos created by the most trusted name in claims, Adjuster Adjuster TV at adjustertvplus.com. Hey, what's up? Matt here with Adjuster TV. And for the best tips and tools for getting on the first call list as an independent adjuster, subscribe now. And if you really, 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 really like this video and you didn't know it, we actually have a podcast version of this. And if you like it, head on over to iTunes and give us a five star review or one star review. I mean, whichever one you want to do, it's entirely up to you. I would prefer a five. Um, so in, in continuation of our series of, we're kind of on kind of a sort of a free coaching call. Um, we have Chrissy Dotson from Oklahoma, and she has some really, really good questions um, about deployments, pay, I firms, and that sort of thing. So we'll just go ahead and get started, Chrissy. Uh, maybe give everybody a little bit of a brief um, kind of an overview of like where you're at in your journey, uh, what you've done so far, um, and then we'll kind of go from there. Well, Christy Dotson, I've, um, I've stumbled on this about nine months ago, and I just dove right in. I didn't look right or left. And uh, one of the first things I saw was, was one of your videos, which was really, it really, it really sh showed me and pointed me in the right direction. Uh, one of the other major things I've done is got my New York license. And that's been a, a really, really big hit. So, um, but I, 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 there's still a lot of questions that I have that's just unknowns that sure. um, I really appreciate your insight. Yeah, absolutely. So let's get started. So what's, what do you got uh, to kind of kick this thing off with? I mean, what's your kind of like the big one? Well, one of my big ones is if I'm on 50 different um, IA firm rosters yep. and I'm getting, getting close to that and there's an event and I have 50 different people calling aren't the 49 that I have to turn down, aren't they going to get irritated and stop calling me? So that's a outstanding question. And I think everybody has that. And really it's, it's pretty simple. I think um, the firms, whether you're brand new or you've been doing this for a while, they know that your phone's blown up with everybody, right? They're going to assume that you've got calls from, you know, at least maybe two or three or four other firms saying, Hey, um, we want you to go to the Gulf to, to help us with claims. Um, just to kind of real quick overview in just in general on standby. Um, and for people who don't understand exactly what it is, is basically when there's a big hurricane or there's a big wildfire, or there's a big hail storm or something like that. Um, you can be on standby for any number of different kinds of storms. Um, the carriers are calling their 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 firms, the IA firms that that run claims for that provide adjusters for them to run claims with, and they're saying, "Hey, we have you know Hurricane Katrina hit 
you know, Waveland, Mississippi, we have, you know, 75% of that market is our insureds. And we're going to, we know we're going to need at least 500 adjusters, right? Something like that. The firm, because they may have an, ag an agreement with the, the carrier to say that, you know, no matter what, up to a certain level, you know, we'll be able to provide adjusters for you. They're going to want to say, yeah, we can totally do that because if they can't, then they're not going to get the, the event, you know, they, or they might not get as big of a piece of it. If they, if they can't commit, you know, 500 adjusters, or maybe they can say we can, you know, commit 250 of those. They know on their roster, they've got that many people unavailable and everybody's watching the hurricanes, right. When they're coming in. So they're all like the fir the firms are saying, all right, well, we know these, you know, 647 people are all st available and currently not deployed with us. We're going to start with those guys. Right. So there's a little bit of kind of the behind the scenes stuff um, regarding standby. And it's a lot of like panic, I think on both the carrier and the I firm side, because they want to get those events staffed. They want to be able to, you know, they, they know that they need X number of adjusters for X number of claims to, to make it to where as a homeowner, you're like, Oh my gosh, my house is gone or whatever. Um, you call in and they say, instead of saying, well, it's probably going to be six weeks till an adjuster gets there. They can say they'll be there in 24 hours. It'll be, or will call you in 24 hours. She'll be there in, in, within a week or whatever it is. Um, they want to be able to do that, which is really what the, the carrier between the carrier and the insured is you and me and the, the IA firm. And so we're kind of the bridge for that. As far as standby goes, um, the firms will, they'll put out a blanket, like a text message a lot of the time. Um, I think if you get onto the core of a firm's, like their, their core roster where you're being worked, used all the time, um, they'll call you and they say, hey, listen, you know, I want to put you on standby for this hurricane thing. We're 99% uh, sure that, you know, we'll be able to give you much total losses. Da, 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 da. Can you commit, you know, whatever? Yes or no. Um, but if it's like, you know, if you haven't run claims for a company before and you're on their roster, I still get deployment, like standby things year for companies I've never worked for. Somehow I got on the roster. Um, if you say, so the, your basic question is, is if you say yes, to one, if you say yes to all of them, and then the first one that calls you back, you say, okay, I'm going to go with you. Um, are the rest of them going to be mad? Um, it's, a, it's a little bit of a gray area. Um, I think if you ask the firms, they're going to say, um, you know, if you say yes to a standby, like in the text, you say yes, right? Instead of, instead of no or stop or whatever, you say yes. Um, they're going to really want you to have to like, when they call you to say, okay, I'm, I'm walking out to the worth my bags. Just help point me in the direction where I need to, to drive to. Um, I think the reality is, and what the firms know is the reality and what kind of everybody does is on our side as the, as the independent contractor, um, you can't say yes to one standby text message and no to the rest of them, right? The reality is you're going to have to say yes to all of them. Um, I would say if you haven't ever worked, um, that was my, uh oh, if you haven't ever worked um, claims for a particular firm, um, then you're kind of not really on their radar. You, you, they've already called all their core people and put and gotten their standby stuff from everybody. And so they're reaching deep and deeper and deeper and deeper into their sort of reserve roster. Um, if you say yes and to, you know, we'll say 50, I would tell you to go with the first person that calls almost no matter who it is. Um, and say, you know, they'll, cause they'll call you, they should call you and say, Hey, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're deploying for this. We have you on standby. You said, yes, are you ready to go? They're going to ask you again. Are you ready to go? Are you, are you still good to go? It's, you know, we're going on this and you say, yep, yep. Just tell me where to go. Um, you're not going to be on like, do you, are you really on 50 rosters? A lot, a lot of rosters. I mean, I'm like, like I'm saying, the New York license shot me to the top. Yeah. So I would say you're probably, even if you're on like two dozen rosters, you're probably not going to get a standby notice from all of them. Um, if, you know, I would say if, if you're, if you, if you get um, a half a dozen from like the half a dozen biggest IA firms that you know, like, you know, Crawford, Eberl, Pilot Alacrity, uh, Renfro, um, Pace setter, the companies, you know, and there's a, there's a handful more of, of the bigger companies. Um, 
they're all probably going to send you a standby thing, especially the ones that have a State Farm account. Like every everyone with a State Farm account is probably going to send you a standby notice. Um, if there's half a dozen of them, I would say first first one that calls you, you say yes to. I'd call the other ones or text them back. I don't know if they check it or not, um, and say you know I'm now unavailable for this. Thank you for your consideration. But call them and just say. Hey, I was just put on standby. My, my adjuster number is this. Um, just want to let you know that I'm not, I'm not available. Uh, so take me off standby. It's like a 13 second phone call. Um, won't take you very long to do it. Um, if you have to leave a message with somebody, at least you did, did it. Um, nobody else does that. I can promise you nobody. Maybe there's one person out there who's going to come in. I totally do that all the time. Um, if if you if you take yourself off standby with a company, then it helps helps them plan, right? And I would t- tell everybody to do this because no matter what they say, we're gonna we're gonna say yes to every standby unless there's a company that we always work for and we know is going to be our one. We're gonna no- ignore all the other standby requests. Um, so long story short, I would say don't sweat it. Say yes to you know the half a dozen or ten or maybe twelve. If it's a big 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 event, um, you know say yes to those in the text message, or if they call say, yes, put, put me on standby, please. Um, and then uh, if they say something like, well, you know, if you, if you go on standby and you, and you t- turns out you go with somebody else, you know, um, we're going to be mad at you. Then I would say, then, then don't put me on standby. Right? Maybe I don't want to work for that company. Um, and then when, when somebody calls, go with them. Um, your first choice, you know, I, you're not really going to know who the first choice is at this point, you, because you could develop a, a relationship with any number of companies um, really hit it off with their management team. Um, right. and the next person is, doesn't hit it off with them, right? They're, they're, they butt heads and it's, you know, so it's, it's, it's hard to sit here and say, well, so-and-so is the best. So-and-so is the worst. It's really who you kind of click with. So you're going to figure that out as you go. And, you, you know, if, with your personality, um, you're going to make friends with probably everybody and be like, click with everybody. Right. So you're going to be, you know, be able to go with any, any firm and, and have a, great time. Um, so, and then, you know, after, after you say yes to the one, then, you know, text the other ones or send them an email. If they email, you email them back say, Hey, listen, I'm uh, sorry. I have to, you know, plans changed. You don't have to say why just say I'm no longer available. I'll take me off your standby list. Thank you for your consideration. Uh, hope to see you on the next one. Yeah. Bye. Whatever. And that's it. That's all I would do. Um, and then, the thing about it is, I mean, it's these storms and not to go off on too big. I'm, I'm, you probably could tell I go, can go off on a tangent. Um, there, there's so much chaos, you know, the, even the biggest firms with the biggest carrier, you know, if you have a, a hurricane that, that wipes across Florida and then goes back in the Gulf and Gulf and restrengthens and then hits Louisiana and then comes back out again and it hits Houston and it just goes everywhere. They'll call you and they'll say, okay, Christy, uh, start heading towards Mobile and go to the induction center and we'll get you all set up, go there. And then they'll say, you'll sit there and wait for longer than you think you should for to get your claims. And finally, they'll give you claims um, or they'll say, hey, we need you to head towards Miami. And then you'll be halfway to Miami and they'll call you and they say, nope, go to Houston. Right. And you'll be like, okay. And just, you know, no problem. Just tell me where to, I'm, I got, you know, spare gas that I bought before the prices went up. <laughs> in the back of my truck, I'm good to go, you know, or whatever. Um, so it's even after you get the deployment until you have the claims, like you're holding them in your hand and you're like, this is, these are the people I'm calling right now. And these are the people I'm going to go look at their houses. I'm going to write estimates for them. And then they're going to give me money for these. Everything's up in the air. Okay. And this is a, just a general message to everybody. You're not truly deployed until you've got claims in your hand because a couple of years ago, Two, three, four, was it three years ago? Um, we had Florence, I think it was Florence and Michael, maybe. And people were sent and they overstaffed it. That was turned out not to be a very big storm. And people got zero claims or they got 10 claims on a hurricane. And there were some, you know, sore, sore folks. Let's put it that way, uh, which totally understandable. But it, it's again, it's you can't know really until the thing makes landfall. And they start making an assessment and the claims start coming in. Right. Um, So that's what I would tell you as far as like hurricane, like big deployments like that, which is 
likely going to be one of your first chances, um, depending on, I mean, you say you got a New York license, which is a big, big deal. And they're probably going to try to put you on something sooner than hurricane, you know, like the, really the peak of hurricane season, which is later in the summer because you're valuable, right? So you, you've put in a lot of work to get that New York license and they're going to want to try to keep you busy. So, um, you know, the advice I would give you there is to kind of be more proactive than reactive. So, you know, instead of like saying, well, I'll just, you know, wait for the standby calls to come in. You see something on the news or the weather, you know, three and a half inch hail hits Oklahoma city. It's the middle right smack dab in the middle of the suburbs of Dallas or whatever. I'm calling my firm saying, Hey, I just noticed, you know, blah, 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 just some hails, whatever. I'm ready to go. I'm certified for this carrier and that carrier. Um, if you guys need me, I'm ready. Right. And just call and just ping them. And there's a good chance that they'll say, okay, yeah, cool. Cause the guy might've been right in the middle of making a bunch of phone calls and you just, you made it easy for him. Um, so that's, well, that's my emailing. advice. I'm sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. I'm emailing, uh, all the ones I met at NACA every, yeah. every two weeks. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I'll for sure. Here. I'm not to be there. I am. And I would say even like add a little piece of value to it. Um, every time you get a new license, you, you know, I just got approved for my Minnesota license, which is a big one. I would, I would suggest, suggest going after the Minnesota license. Um, just got that. Um, here's my license number. Just want to update HR or whatever. Right. I've got one Minnesota. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. So how many licenses do you have, Christy? 13. 13. 13. Okay. Lucky Only 13. 21 more to go. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, following on that, um, is it a waste of time for me to get certification after certification? And do IA firms really even look at that? I mean, I've got my California earthquake, my fair claims, my um, state farms, my uh, oh, uh, TWIA, Hague, wind and um, residential roofing. I mean, I... Uh, yeah. So I would say these, these kind of things, like some of the things like maybe TWIA and, and CEA, California Earthquake Authority, um, those are, are things that, that, you know, you, I mean, you maybe it's been a day or two on those, or at least the, the California earthquake thing, right? You maybe just had a seminar, right? It's online, yes. Yeah. Um, those are value, absolutely valuable. Um, you know, the last time I think that I know a bunch of people were sent to California for an earthquake was, it's been a, it's been a, a little bit, um, but it could happen like any second, right? It's just the insurance companies are just sitting there waiting. There's like a phone, it's a red phone. It says earthquake on it. When that rings, they're, they're, it's all hands on deck. Um, so having that is, is valuable. Um, the firms are going to, are going to put value on that. They're going to say, all right, well, she, she checks off on that. And maybe, you know, the, the TWIA, um, the carrier certifications, all that kind of stuff, they may sort, you know, their roster by what certifications you have. All right. We need somebody who's got, you know, um, a New York license and has, well, TWIA, that wouldn't make any sense because that's Texas, but you got a Texas license and you got TWIA and you got this and you got that and you being, you pop up in the next, in the top 20 people that they just did on that search, then they might be giving you a call for something. Um, they might be also giving you a call, um, because you, you I, th I think with these kind of certifications, there's really sort of two um, ways to think about it and sort of ways to view them. So the, the first way is as uh, sort of like skills and certification and like credentialing of yourself, right? So like the Hague stuff, um, that's and things like that. Those are skills building things, right? You're gonna you're gonna learn damage identification, you're going to learn about roofs, you're going to learn about that kind of thing. So that when you go out in the field on your own and, you, and you're doing your work, that your files look good, right? They're, they're solid. They're not based on like, well, I'm just guessing and hoping, right? Just somebody, some guy at the, you know, the orientation thing gave me a, a macro. And I'm going to throw that in and see what happens, right? You're going to know why that's, this needs to be in there and that doesn't need to be in your estimate. Um, the other way to, you know, to view them is as sort of a, um, as, as, as a way to say to the firms, you got some skin in the game, right? So you, you're all in on this. You're going and you're getting a lot of licenses. You've got a lot of certifications. You know, every time they call you and they say, Hey, we've got, you know, an all state certification or a USAA or this or that. You're like, all right, I'll be there. 
right? And you go and you do it. And, and, and again, and it, those are good networking opportunities, as you, as you certainly know. Um, you're going to see those people again. They're going to see your face again. Oh, Christy, how's it going? Tell me, you know, how are those calves? calving season starts up soon, doesn't it? And, blah, blah, blah. and they're going to, you know, it's going to be, it's, it's a great way to, to continue to make to touch points or to have like, you know, touches with the I firms to, to remind them that you're alive and that you're, you're, you're who you are. And when they look at you on paper, they're saying, all right, this person spent a lot of time and money and resources um, getting ready for this, this work. We got to figure out something for this person to do because they're, they're, they're pretty valuable. And they see this, it says something about you. It's almost like a, getting a bachelor's degree, right? You know, getting a college education, I think, says that you were able to finish something, right? So maybe not that you're an expert on really anything other than, you know, like if I look back at my college education and maybe like writing a memo, like I had a class, like a, that's, that's a, the one thing I can remember from, from accounting. That was the other way. Like I wasn't very good at math, even though I use math all the time as an adjuster. I did really well at accounting and I was like, I'm, I'm surprised that I'm getting A's in accounting. Anyway, so those are like little things, right? Um, same thing goes for these certifications that, you know, they tell the firms that you're, you're all in and that you're ready to, you're ready to do this. So. I took your advice at the very beginning. Um, I'm using this downtime, uh, you know, November through March. Uh, as just to invest, invest, invest in my in myself and and in my business, and I, I'm hoping it pays off sooner or later. Oh yeah, it will. And that's the other thing is is that you know you you have an expectation. Hopefully, if you don't, you're getting ready to <laughs> that. This is a bit of a marathon. It's not a sprint, right? Especially getting to the, to the starting line, right? The starting line is out there somewhere. You can't see it. You have a guess where it could be, right? But it, move, it can move, you know, you might see it right there in front of you. And then suddenly this, the hurricane veers off and then your starting lens vanishes off in the distance again. Um, you have to have an expectation that that's going to happen. Once you get claims in your hand and you have the opportunity to close those claims, you know, you're going to start slow and you're going to ramp up and you're going to learn how to be an adjuster. You're going to learn how to be on the road. You're going to learn how to deal with contractors and homeowners and do all that stuff. And start to build up speed, reduce your cycle time. And the firms are looking at you because they're always watching to see who's, whose numbers are going up, ramping up, getting up there and staying up there. Um, then they'll start, they'll start giving you more claims, right? On maybe on the, even on that first event, they might give you 50 claims to start or 30 claims, right? And then two or three weeks into it, you know, you're kind of knocking it out of the park, right? You, you've, you've stuck in there, you've, you've held on, to the thing as it's trying to kick you off and you closed a claim and then you closed another one and then you closed four more and then you, you know, so on and so forth. And they're going to, they're going to see that because not everybody's going to every people in your position, brand new, they may have a resume that's got more stuff on it than yours does. But once they get on that storm site and they start feeling the pressure from, I mean, it's all sides. They're trying to make a diamond out of you. And it's some people just crack and split and can't do it. Um, if you, if you take my advice and you try to close only the claims that you've inspected that day, by the end of that day, you want to have the, the, that number of claims closed, whether it's one or five or six or whatever it is, right? You're going to ramp, you're going to try to like ramp up to four or five, six wind claims on a hurricane. It's not that hard to do. Hail claims is not that hard to do. Um, bigger claims, obviously wildfire and stuff like that. It's going to be a totally different story, but the first day you go out, you know, you, you do that first inspection in the morning and then you take that claim and anybody who will help you, whether you have to like, you know, go to their house. And I was getting ready to say somebody's name, but I'm not going to <laughs> go to somebody's house and go to the help room, go to wherever you need to go, whatever field support they have, or whether it's, uh, you know, the help room, they call them war rooms, which I think they're kind of moving away from that. Go get that claim done that day. Cause once you see that process from making the phone call to hitting close, the whole thing's done, right. You turn in your invoice and everything else. That's, that's seeing like the matrix, right. That's, that's getting the, seeing the process from start to finish. Once you see that process start to finish doing the next one is you'll take half the time. And doing the next one will take you half the time of that one again, because it's, 
the, the hard part about getting started in these claims is knowing what to do next in the claims workflow, what the process is, right? Once you see it, you know everything that's supposed to go in that file and how they want it to look, then that's that's the hardest part. But it's also the easiest part because it's not that hard, right? It's just not knowing. Um, I've got a plug for your cat, cat survival school. So I've downloaded everything and put in my owner's manual. <laughs> <laughs> nice ads and everything. So um, I, I really do feel like that's going to come in very handy. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, I, I, I totally <laughs> forgot. Um, so yeah. So so you have my like the whole like way. That's why I ran claims. Like that's you know as a as a fast adjuster as an experienced advanced adjuster. And and when I got started, you know I realized that you know new people could absolutely benefit by just seeing the process, just like start to finish. You know the two big stress things that you have the biggest, well, there's a, a lot of them, but the two biggest ones are not having built your schedule and not making all your, making your phone calls and knowing every, where everybody's going to be taken care of. Once that happens, I mean, the level of stress that that takes off, it's probably 75% of the stress. Really? And then you, you like walk out the door and the sun's shining, the birds, and you're like, I know exactly what I'm going to do every hour of every day for the next three weeks, whatever it is. Um, the other big stressor is um, not knowing that, not having a closed claim and not knowing the full process it takes you a day to do that. Cause you're just going to go grab somebody and make them sit down with you. And if they try to wander off and grab them again, and make them I just, help, I just, just tell me to help, to help me close this one file and then I'll leave you alone. Right. It's all, you, that's your job for that day. Um, once you get to the point to where you've, you've gone over those two humps, right. If you knock down those two big stress things, they're going to start giving you claims if you're, you know, closing more than one claim a day. I think even if you're closing one claim a day, as a new adjuster, um, they're probably going to try to hang on to you, especially if you're, you know, if their phone's not ringing with people yelling and screaming that you're told them you're going to be there this time and you didn't show up and whatever, um, they'll start giving you more claims, right? So that first storm event, you want to get your first batch of claims, and then you're going to get, hopefully, if you do it right, more claims, right? And then because they saw how this, they'll have like an after action sort of a meeting or whatever, all the, 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 the honchos and everybody, they'll sit there and say, all right, so who, who was the, the shooting stars and who were the ones that we're not going to ever hire again, right? Let's, let's have a, a talk about our roster, right? And you're going to be at the top of that or close to the top of that list. Brand spanking new, did a bunch of work beforehand. It wasn't just for show. You know, it turns out that you retained what you learned and that you, it clicked, right? It, the whole thing clicked with you. The whole like sort of world of adjusting and doing like a big cat clicked, right? Let's hang on to her for sure. Let's try to keep her busy. I think there's some things we can have. She's in, you know, uh, central Oklahoma or Western Oklahoma. There's probably some things that, you know, that we can throw her away, you know, or maybe see if she wants to go down to Dallas for, you know, whatever it is. Right. So they're going to try and keep the people that they really, really like, they're going to try to keep you busy. Because if they don't, somebody else will. That's right? true. Bottom line to that whole thing. Um, so get claims on your first cat. Getting that first cat is takes a while, right? Once you get on there, you want to make sure that you, you close claims, that you get more claims, and then you get more storms. And then so over the course of every the year, every year after that, you're getting either more deployments or you're just getting more claims, right? So that's the kind of the, the overarching goal. Um, and I would say those things, you know, the certifications and those things are going to get you on the board and they're going to get you, they're going to be th the things that you can kind of fall back on when you're in doubt and you have to make a decision. You know, you'd be like, all right, well, where, where somebody might get up on a roof and look around and be like totally bewildered, you're going to, you're going to remember your Hague damage ID stuff. Well, that's, that's a wind damage shingle. That one's not. Right. And you're going to write, be able to do the, at least that part. Right. And if, because you get so many of those, every part of that process you're going to have those little pieces of training in your brain to kind of fall back on to help you, you know, make it through that first day and then the fifth day and then the 50th day and then the 500th day and so on and so forth. Once you get on that first storm, the, the, nobody's going to look at your resume ever again. Like it's just, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, other than to say, you know, we need somebody who's TWIA certified or we just had a big earthquake, you know, or whatever. Um, and again, you can still, for the purposes of after you've, you've gotten, you know, your first work, you can still ping your firms and be like, Hey, I just picked up, um, you know, the Florida citizens certification, you know, which is 
I think that yeah, that's probably not a good example because I think only certain firms can do that and you have to do it through those firms. But you, you get my, my kind of my point, you can still do your little bit of like light networking, pinging people, you know, once you've gotten, um, rolling on a storm and they're giving you claims, um, you don't have to bug them every two weeks necessarily, but I would say, you know, starting in March, April, you know, I would, and then hurricane season, if you see like, if they start showing spaghetti models on the, the weather channel, then I'm going to be like, you know, Hey, just letting you know, I'm standing by, I've got my Florida, I've got my Carolinas, I got my Georgia, I got my everything. Um, I'm ready to go. Right. So to answer that question, yes, those are valuable. Um, I, there's probably a point of diminishing returns, I would say. Um, so you want to kind of get the critical ones, the ones that are going to help you with construction damage ID. Um, you know, the ones that are the carrier certifications, 100,000%, you need those. Um, if, if for nothing else, that just gives you more opportunities. Plus a lot of those, you know, they may have online versions of those. If, if they have an in-person thing, I would go to the in-person thing because it's, you know, you're going to have more opportunities to network. So next month I'm going down to Texas to do the all state. It's like a 10 day. Yeah. Pilot. Yeah. There you go. Oh yeah. That's, that's a, a 10 day certification. That would be yeah. a good one. <laughs> you meet the, pilot, the, the pilot honchos probably they'll come in and, and uh, chat you guys up for sure. But yeah, that's that's awesome. It's going to be a rope and harness too. And so, I, and I want some real world talk with you right now because I'm four foot 11 and I weigh 107 pounds. Okay. A, a, do you think that I'm physically strong enough to do a rope and harness, including carrying the ladder around? Because I, I, I struggle with my 16 foot or aluminum. Um. So the, I would say for the rope and harness, um, I guess it depends. Um, you may not necessarily, you're not going to use rope and harness on every claim, obviously in Texas, you might, because it's I had most of the, I had to turn down an appointment yesterday oh. to New York because I don't have my rope and harness. Okay. Um, there's the gear itself is not heavy. There's a, depending on like which, which system you use, there's like a weighted, like pilots can probably have like a weighted sled with a bunch of 45 pound, like Olympic barbell weights that you drag into the backyard. Um, or you fill up like a, a big drum up with water or something like that. Um, the ropes and everything. I mean, if you get up on the roof, I mean, you're lightweight. Um, you probably have a better strength to weight ratio as far as like doing climbing around on a house, as far as the ladders go, um, that's a good question. I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to imagine like a way that you could, you know, is it that you're just like, it's just carrying it from the truck to the house or setting it up and leaning it on the house or all of the above, or. Well, I mean, for instance, the gorilla, uh -huh. it's just, I couldn't even pick it up off. Oh, that. Okay. So is that like an extension ladder? Um, I've tried it folds to, up. I've done the telescope, tried to pick up the telescoping uh -huh. teles uh, ladders too heavy. Anything above maybe 20 was just unmanageable. Okay. Um, I would suggest because you're a hundred pounds, 107, <laughs> 107 um, seven is the hat. Um, so if, if you look into like a, an extension ladder, an aluminum extension ladder, those folding ladders are, all of them are heavy. Like they, they're necessarily heavy, I think, because they've got mechanisms and the little giants and the gorillas and those things. I mean, those are hard for like me to like fling around. Um, I would say if you can find a, like a 24 foot or an 18, 20 plus foot long, um, lightweight aluminum ladder, they make those ladders in different weight ratings. Right. So like I would buy it, the ones weight rated for 225 pounds or 325 pounds or 350 or whatever it is, because I'm heavier, right. Um, at your weight, they have like a lower end of that, which, you know what, let's go on. Residential? Let's check out the internet here. Um, they make a lighter weight, sort of a lighter duty, I should think. Um, Oh, how do you spell aluminum? Um, 
that's going to be lighter to carry around, right? So the weight rating, let me see, 225 might be the lowest. I mean, with all the females coming into the, uh, this industry, you'd think that they would be a little more foresighted, these ladder companies. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the overall weight of the 20 foot um, aluminum extension ladder is 27 pounds. Which one is that? It's on, it's on homedepot.com. It's a Werner. Um, it's the 225 pound load capacity one. So what I'm saying is like, you can, that's one of the reasons why I always use aluminum ladders is because they're so light and okay. because do they don't, that. they don't need to be that heavy. The, the part that gets to be a challenge when the longer you go is, uh, when you stand it up, if the wind's blowing a little bit, um, you're going to be, it's going to be a rodeo in the front yard. A 24 footer, which is the minimum that I, I personally would go for, gets you on, it can get you on, I think most things is 33 and a half pounds. So it's about five pounds heavier, give or take. When I went to, I guess I went to Lowe's, not Home Depot, and I was trying to lift them up and it was just. Yeah. So if, if you get it out in the, get it out in the parking lot um, and then kind of, fling it around out there or buy one and take it home. I mean, you can always take it back, um, keep the receipt um, and just, you know, practice, you know, put in, what kind of car do you have? I have a Jeep four door ring, um, hard top Wrangler. Okay. Um, are you, I got, the ladder, I got the racks. Okay. So you're going to put a ladder. Okay. So you can put a ladder on top of it. So, you, so your challenge as, uh, you know, for your size and weight is going to be getting the ladder off of you the top of your Jeep. Um, so you may need a step ladder or something like that for it, or, or some sort of a method where you can like pull it off the back and put the bottom on the ground and then grab it from there and walk it up to the house. Um, and then it's going to be standing it up. Right. And depending on how high the gutter is, you know, you'll need to have, hold it straight up and down and pull on the rope. Right. Mm -hmm. To get the, the extension part to go up, to get to, you know, if it maybe you need to go up, it's, you know, 18 feet instead of, or it's 13 feet instead of 12 feet, whatever it is. Um, those are going to be your challenges. So I would say, go pick one up. I mean, this one is showing 250 bucks at Home Depot. Um, I'm certain that uh, Lowe's has got them too. Um, but you know, if, if you're trying to like get it out of the the rack at the store, I mean, yeah. that's a pain in the butt because you're trying to get it off around the things and I'd have somebody help you do that. Take it home. Uh, make sure that you got the one that's 225 pounds, the lowest weight rating one. And then uh, just mess around with it in, in the yard and maybe the backyard so the neighbor can't see you. <laughs> okay. um, that's what I would do for that. And just see, I mean, it may be, you know, it's, it's a little, there's a little bit of a fitness aspect, not a big one, but I mean, there's, there's a little bit of it because you're going to be manhandling a ladder around. You may have to take the ladder into the backyard. So you need to figure out how to carry it to where it's not going to be awkward. You're not going to bang into things. And there's a really super easy way to carry an extension ladder over your shoulder that in, is, doesn't feel like you're carrying an extension ladder, if you know what, if that makes sense. Um, but I would just, I, that's what I would do in practice with it. And, it. and it may be that, you know, if you're, if you're, because you're four foot 11, you just can't, there's just no like fit because physics is just going to keep you from doing it. Um, then I would say, um, let your firms know and say, Hey, listen, I really, really want to do it. I'm not scared of heights or anything like that. I'm just a little bit too uh, short to be able to, to, you know, wrangle a ladder around what other options do you have for me? What can, and what can we do? Um, you know, an alternative could be, um, you know, if you want to partner up with your spouse or you've got like a friend that really, really wants to do this or a cousin or a brother or sister or whoever, and you like team up and you guys go out together, then they can be the roof climber and you can write the estimate and talk to the homeowner or whatever. There's, there's, there's ways around it. I think, I think that, you know, a 30 pound, it's not light, right. But it's also stretched out over like 12 or 13 feet when it's, you know, not fully extended. Um, it's going to be, it's not as heavy as like picking up like a 35 pound, like a kettlebell or something like that. Where it like this. Um, so, but I don't know. I, that's what I, that, that's my suggestion. Let me know. 
Cause I want to know, like, kind of, I, I feel like I'm, I'm not able to give you a very good answer. Um, cause I haven't I females. I know other females are running into this too. So it'd be yeah. really good to get this figured out. Sure. Sure. Um, the telescoping ladders, they're heavy, even for me, like, cause it's, you know, it's a bunch of tubes all like nested inside each other. Um, those gorilla things and the, the little giants in particular, I mean, they, they're super stable when you set them up on something, they're not going to move anywhere, but they're also very, very, very heavy. And they're, you know what, now that I think about it, a, a, a buddy of mine, I have two adjuster friends, um, neither one of them are doing claims anymore. They kind of retired off into other things, but they, they got started about the same time I did. Um, they were both five, three ish. They're more petite fellows <laughs> and, uh, they ran around and did, they, they didn't have any problems with it. Um, obviously they probably have a little bit more upper body strength. Um, but it, there's nothing, no upper body strength that's going to help you when the ladder is just too long. Um, so one, one of my friends, um, and this is what prompted me to like, stop buying little giants and whatever. Um, I went and he's like, I'm like, basically I was like, Hey, I'm just kind of done for the day. He's like, what do you have to do? He's like, oh, I got one more and I won't give it, let's go hit a happy hour or whatever. And I was like, all right. Um, but I happened to be in the same neighborhood and I was driving by us. He was wrapping up and he had one piece of an extension ladder, not the whole extension ladder. He took like the top part off of the ladder and just use that. And it was like, you could pick it up with one hand like this. And I was like, whoa, 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 what are you doing there? He's like, it's like, man, I got so tired of trying to like pull these big heavy ladders around. I just like took this end off of this thing and I can get on most things with it. And if I can't, then I got I can get this other ladder. I can like wrestle up there, but I was like, huh. So it's like a 12 foot, just a section out of a long extension ladder. And it's wow. weighs nothing. I mean, it's just, it's half the way, it's like 15 pounds or less. So I don't know that's, that could be an option as well. I mean, if you get creative with it, you're just trying to get on a, on a roof, right? It's, you know, it's what, however you can get up there. So. Okay. All right. Well, I'll keep you updated on that. Uh, yeah, for sure. What's that? We have time for one more. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Keep going. We got plenty of time. Okay. So I know in four years, I will be ready to become NFIP certified. Um, but as a brand new adjuster, with so many other things to learn, would it make sense for me to put in the time and take these NFIP classes and get my mentorship uh, started now? Um, I'm kind of of two minds on this. And, and I would say, you know, my answer in the past has sort of been predicated on what I would personally do. Um, but I think in general and, and knowing the sort of the need of the IA firms, um, when they have a big hurricane, it's not just wind, right? It's, it's almost, almost always, there's a lot of storm surge, there's a lot of flooding and water. Um, and those are significant claims. Um, I think that my suggestion would be to, to go through a company like Crawford and do their, like, uh, the F let's see, let's see, what is it? The flood there's, they have a couple of acronyms for like a sort of a, they were talking about it at the conference. They have a, a couple of programs uh, for people who don't have four years of experience to, to do like sort of an accelerated um, apprenticeship program um, where I think they, they get you it's in lieu of the four years kind of a thing. Um, so I would double check with, with Crawford, everybody. I, I hear a lot of talk about flood. Um, I've done it to like this, the smallest amount of flood and you know, I, wind and hail always kept me super busy. Um, but for, for you again, I mean, if, if you, especially if you just don't want to climb her up, I mean, who can blame you? Um, it's, it's not a bad way to go as long as there's the volume there. And that's, that's always been my kind of concern with flood is that, well, you know, a big storm system might park itself over, you know, the, the you know, the quad cities or whatever in on the Mississippi river, and just dump water and just dump and dump and dump and dump. And then everything south of that floods out. Right. And that happens like every 10 or 15 years, it seems like um, it doesn't, but it doesn't happen every year. Right. So it's like, it's, I don't, I don't see like a whole lot of like, there's always a flood event going. And I got a bunch of flood adjuster guys that are always going out and doing flood stuff until there's a hurricane. And then it's like, it might be even in some cases where there's hardly any wind claims. It's just all 
flood because they had a tropical storm, right? And just sat there and just dumped water, right? So I would say, you know, previously I was kind of, you know, kind of ambivalent on it. Like I wouldn't personally, um, and I wouldn't suggest it for a brand new person because it, there's that four years and, you know, but I would say now with some of the opportunities that you have for kind of fast tracking that, um, and the fact that there's always going to be on those big events, even if there's not like, like I said, like a lot of wind claims, um, there's going to be water claims for sure. Um, so I would say, I would say keep pushing forward on that. I think that makes you valuable. Um, and I would check out, I don't know if pilots got something like that. Um, I know Avril does, they've got a special like a flood program. So I would definitely check that out. I have. Is that all you got? Well, I've got a couple more, but we kind of, well, yeah, I'm going to do one more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As, an, as a new IA, should I go ahead and take an hourly position during an event? Um, you know, the, from what I'm understanding, new IAs agreeing to a lower pay seems like a huge point of contention with the seasoned IAs. And doesn't it wind up dragging down everyone's pay in the end? Yeah, so... This is where things get controversial. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's the deal. Here's the bottom line of this whole thing. And I actually got a couple of emails about this just in the last day or two. Um, people like saying, Hey, I love your stuff, but man, you know, you talk about the photo and scope thing or this thing or that thing. And you, I think, I feel like it's destroying the industry. It's destroying the industry. The reality is, is that the carriers are the ones that are pushing for the photo and scope thing for the most part. Um, some of the, some of the IA firms in an attempt to um, have a little bit more control over the quality of the files that we turn in. So, which makes it kind of our fault. Um, they are doing the TPA thing where they have a, a photo scoper person out there and then they have somebody at a desk writing it up, like a more experienced adjuster writing those claims up. As far as like the pay goes, um, if you think about it this way, um, if you're offered an hourly or a daily rate um, deployment, like they say, hey, go to Iowa for the derecho or go to it's California for wildfire or go to wherever. Um, if you're brand new, if you've never handled claims before, you're going to be getting paid like the second you show up, right? You're going to start earning money the second you show up. Um, previously, previous to this whole idea of um, doing hourly uh, which has been around for a few years, but it's kind of relatively new. Um, previous to that, you show up on a cat site and if, if you needed it, you could ask for an advance on your pay. Um, they probably would give you a per diem for the days to two or three or four, maybe four days where you're doing orientations and you're waiting to get your claims. And then after that, you're on your own, right? You get your, get your one advance for 2000 bucks and hope that you can start closing some claims. If you're doing it hourly, then you can, you know, they might give you a, a little bit of a lighter claims load. They might give you a, a lighter claims load either way, but you know, you're, you're not going to be under the gun as much doing it hourly, which when they say hourly, they're really, it really it's really like a day rate, right? So they're going to say, all right, you're going to, we're going to pay you for seven, 12 hour days. Um, it comes out to this per day. Um, or it comes out to this per hour, but here's what you're going to get paid every paycheck. Um, so they, they call it a bunch of different things, but the, it's not like you're going to clock in and clock out. That's, you know, so that's kind of the difference. Um, so I would say um, if you're an experienced adjuster, if you're a veteran adjuster, if you've been doing this for three or four years and you got a lot of storms under your belt, you're doing daily stuff and somebody says, Hey, you want to do hourly? I'd say, no, don't do it. No way. I'm gonna, I want the fee bill. Give me the fee bill or give me death. <laughs> right. Um, but for brand new people, this is a way to help some people that may um, have a, a high potential of, of doing well at this work and, and being a good adjuster and, and being a benefit to our, our industry. Um, but who, for whatever reason, are, are struggling to get the the you know the, the on-site resources to pay attention to them. This happens at every single cat, um, and they they wash out. Nobody's answering their phone calls. They can't get anybody to help them close their claims. Uh, so they just throw <clears throat> they just throw their hands in the air and say, "I'm out." You know, they they call somebody, leave a message, take all my claims away. I don't want them. I'm leaving. Right, and then somebody gets that message a few days, whatever it is, right? Because they're so swamped, right? 
Um, and that person is on a fee schedule. They're not getting paid until they close the claim. And if they can't close the claim, they're not going to get paid. They're not going to be able to pay for their hotel. They're not going to be able to pay for fuel and all that kind of stuff. If they're getting paid hourly, at least there's um, there's a little bit of more support there. They, they can say, all right, well, you know, I'm not going to be up till two or three o'clock in the morning, you know, trying to close these claims. I can take a, d- a deep breath and I can wait for the help room people to get get around to me instead of having a panic attack and throwing everything in the air and running away. I don't know. I mean, it's, that's, that's my thought on it. I think it's beneficial for new people. I would say to, to new folks, go ahead and take an hourly deployment. I mean, you know, or day rate deployment, um, photo and scope for sure. 100%, you know, and I will say this about the photo and scope stuff. Um, I've heard, you know, I haven't done any photo and scope stuff for probably four or five years. And it, it actually paid pretty well four or five years ago. Um, and it was part of a pilot program, like a test program. Um, but these days I'm hearing that the, the pay per like photo and scope assignment is approaching that, what, which that what I kind of getting close to what I averaged doing a full claim previously. So, and it's easier. It's the funnest part of the whole thing, right? You're going out there taking pictures and, you know, you're, you're kind of sort of unraveling the puzzle of the claim and what's going to go on your estimate or what's going to go on a estimate. You're not writing it, right? You're just going to write a scope and take a bunch of pictures, climb around on the roof, measure some stuff, and then hit submit on your app and you're done with it for almost as much as we were getting paid before to do a full claim. In some cases, it's, not, I mean, there are the, the pays are across the board on these things. They're all different, real small, like ridiculously low to like, I wouldn't even do that for that to, oh my gosh, I can't believe they're paying that much for that. Why wouldn't you do that? It's easier. You know, at the end of the day, you know, the sun's down, you can't scope anymore and you don't have to make any phone calls and you don't have to write an estimate and you don't have to just go to sleep. Well, I want to tell you this. I want to say yes to anything they give me. <laughs> yeah, that's bottom line. I would I would say yes to anything that they give you for sure. All right. Um, let's see. Got time for one more. Okay. So considering all of the cat fields, IA's daily expenses while on site, when it's all said and done, does a remote daily uh, uh, remote daily end up making and keeping just as much income as a uh, cat field? So, so remote. Say, if I stayed here in Oklahoma and everybody else is out traipsing off to the, to the, to the cat, am I going to make just as much money? Oh, on their claims. Okay. Yeah. So that's a, that's a really good question. And, uh, the answer is heck yeah, you are, you might make more. And here's why, because if you say, all right, well, you know, I've got a couple of cats under my belt. Um, I've, I've got experience now. I'm going to call my firms and tell them I don't want to go on cat. I want to stay home. I want to do field only. Um, or I want to do, uh, daily only within a 200 mile radius or whatever you d- decide, you know, if you're close enough to a big city, then, you know, you probably, you, you should have a lot more opportunities for daily claims because the toilet is not going to, you know, doesn't care what the weather's doing. It's just going to break when it's going to break um, and it's going to cause damage. And that claim is going to get filed any time of the year period randomly. Um, so I would say when hurricane Katrina rolls up, and all the daily adjusters, you know, they hear about all the giant fee, fee bills and everything that everybody's earning on those things. And they, they drop everything that they're doing to run off and go do daily claim or to go do cat. And you're like, no, I'm staying here to do it. You're going to get their claims of people in your area, first of all. Second of all, you're going to get their undying love and devotion because you, they, they, just because they've got a cat, right? It maybe it's for the same company, right? Doesn't mean the daily stuff stops. Right. The daily stuff's never going to, it doesn't stop. It just, it just does what it does. Right. So you can, I know a lot of daily people who only do daily who make more than most cat adjusters, you know, depending on where you're at, it, it kind of depends on if there's a lot of volume uh, or you live with near an area that's got like a, a lot of large structures or you're doing a lot of commercial stuff. Um, you can do really well. That's absolutely 1000% a viable way to go. A lot of companies, the, the caveat I'll give you on that is that a lot of companies are going to um, prefer that you have some experience doing claims 
at some level before they start handing you daily claims because daily claims, they're going to be random, right? They're going to be a lot of water losses, right? So a lot of broken appliances and plumbing and that sort of thing. Most of your claims are going to be that. There'd be a little bit of wind sprinkled in here and there. There's going to be fires, small ones, little ones, big ones, or yeah, small, medium size, and big ones. Um, there's going to be vandalism claims. There's going to be, you know, some guy driving down the street in the middle of the night, plows in the front of the house claims. There's going to be theft claims. There's going to be a lot of random stuff that is, are really going to f- kind of flex your ability to dig into the policy. Um, to write a good estimate, to be able to go meet a contractor and looking at the front of a house with a truck sticking out of it and be able to th- talk intelligently with that guy about what we're going to do with this claim, right? So th- they, they're they more complex, they require more um, more ex- experience and knowledge. And like, you know, you're not going to have, nobody's going to have like ultimate knowledge of everything, but you're going to know where to go to get the information that you need, right? So on the policy, you'll know how to, where to search in the policy for truck in front of the house. You know, for the construction stuff, you know, you may have like some mentor or uh, uh, some sort of a, a resource at your eye firm that, you, that knows everything that there is to know about construction. And you can text them a picture and say, hey, what, do you, what would you do? Here? Where would you start on this, this kind of a claim, right? Um, so, yes, to answer your question, I would totally do that um, if you can. But I think it's going to be another one of those, like have an expectation that the starting line is going to be moving around on you. Um, that you're probably going to have to, um, probably going to have to do cat to start some kind of cat or some sort of like um, assignment where you're, you know, you're in Oklahoma. You know, you might call Paysetter Claim Service. Um, it's training because you uh, recommended them. Yeah, have you ever talked to them? Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, uh, Jennifer. Yeah, they're a great company. Um, uh, they should be, you know, they're based in Tulsa. So I mean, it's like, they're, that's not that far away from you. Um, but they may, they may say, well, Hey, listen, you know, you got a bunch of certifications on here. You know, we see that you're, you know, you're, you're uh, excited about this. You're all in, you're raring to go. We're going to kind of give you some, some, you know, some daily claims locally, one or two and help you with them to get you started. That some companies will do that. They, they'll take it on a case by case basis. Um, so you never know. They sent me on some ride alongs case setter has. Yeah. Yeah. So you can kind of watch people do it. Um, so that would be my suggestion for that. And I would say if you, if you, you know, if you enjoy traveling, but you don't enjoy it like enough to where you're going to be like on the road for seven months out of the year, which is always a possibility on cat. Um, and you just, you want to be able to stay home and sort of like tell your manager, you know, for the first, the two weeks before Christmas or over Christmas that you want to like, just cut me off from claims for those two weeks. And then I'll work the rest of it or whatever you want to do. I mean, it's, you know, the claims are going to always be there and your managers, the the IA firms are always going to, they're always going to be looking for somebody to help them with a problem. And the problem is going to be that one claim that nobody else wants to drive to, you go drive to it. Right. right. So those are my suggestions on that. So they're all good. awesome. Awesome. Well, any follow-up questions or anything else that, you know, kind of prompted by this? We've covered so much ground. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Um, so because that you uh, agreed to do this, which I appreciate it very much, and, and hopefully I was able to help you, um, I'm going to give you a free year of Adjuster TV Plus. So um, I'll send you an email on that and we'll get you hooked up with that and stuff. So, but anyway, that's all I got for you. Um, thanks again, Christy. I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks everybody else for watching and have a great storm. Adjuster TV. That's what she said.